Good afternoon. It's Thursday, June 7. I'm Herman Green with the Midday News. A special welcome to those of you watching online at onespotmedia.com. There was another flare-up of violence in Cassava Peace St. Andrew last night. TVJ News has been informed that there was an outbreak of gunfire. It's reported that persons were shot. There has been increased tension in Cassava Peace since Saturday when it's reported that gunmen opened fire on da dance hall entertainer Movado. The Constant Spring Police yesterday charged one of the suspects in the shooting. The police have asked Movado to report to them for questioning in relation to the upsurge in violence. His 17-year-old son and brother were among five persons taken into custody on Tuesday following a raid at the entertainer's Norbrook St. Andrew residence. Movado, who is now overseas, is expected to return to the island on the weekend. The Office of a Children's Advocate is now involved in the murder case in which a 13-year-old boy is implicated in the death of a 9-year-old girl. The incident occurred in White House, Westmoreland, on Tuesday. Children's Advocate Diane Gordon Harrison says while the police investigation is in its early stages, her office is already playing a role. We have been in touch with the relevant uh, police division and we are in fact having preliminary discussions and have given some preliminary advice at this stage. So it's a matter that is on the dashboard for the Office of the Children's Advocate. We are actively looking at it from all perspectives at this time. The girl was reported missing about 3.30 Tuesday afternoon when she failed to return from the New Works Primary School which she attended. Her body was found seven hours later in a remote area known as Bog. The boy and the girl are from the same community called Bronte and attend the same school. He is now in police custody. There has been a delay to the start of the trial of two men charged with a quadruple murder in Claremont St. Elizabeth. Denham Campbell and Andward Hines were scheduled to stand trial in the St. Elizabeth Circuit Court yesterday. It was pushed back to November 8 as Mr. Campbell is without legal representation. The two are charged with the May 27, 2015 gun slaying of 70-year-old Ezra Wright, 57-year-old George Brown, 60-year-old Archibald Brown, and 40-year-old Marlon Sanderson, all of Claremont. After years of crying out for the reconstruction of the Port Maria fire station, the community may be a step closer to having those cries answered. The firefighters, who have been relocated at least three times in the last 12 years due to a wide range of issues, were pleased with a recent announcement by local government minister Desmond McKenzie. TVJ's Anthony Lugg has more. It's been like a game of musical chairs for firefighters in Port Maria, St. Mary. Twelve years ago, the fire station was on Rectory Street. Just over a year ago, the community of Trinity. And today, it's still in Trinity, but down the street from the previous location. Firefighters describing the relocation process as a drag say they face the same challenges at each location. The men who are tasked with saving lives are currently operating outside of a house. Not an ideal location for a fire station, still they make do. But spacing is an issue. That takes us back to the previous location, another house, which was shut down due to inadequate space. But after much talks about the construction of a new fire station in Port Maria, local government minister Desmond McKenzie made an announcement recently. The designs have now been completed. The process of tendering is well advanced. And we are going to fulfill that commitment for the construction of the fire station which is badly needed here in this part of the island. A timeline was not indicated but the firefighters say they'll be waiting. Anthony Log, TVJ News. After almost a week of strike action, some workers are back on the job at the multi-billion dollar Mandela Highway Improvement Project. Jamaican workers employed to carry out road works returned to the site this morning. They have been off the job for the past six days, protesting against working conditions including wages. 
Now, President of the Union of Clerical Administration and Supervisory Employees, Vincent Morrison, provided I an have update. Been advised by employees on the project that they have resumed normality. Uh, the fact that they have resumed is a good sign. I'm not sure exactly what is going to happen from now on in terms of the resolution of the issue. Uh, I understand the Ministry of Labor had some of their officers who, who went and checked to see what was happening out there. And um, it would seem that they have proven that the workers are correct. In other words, the workers complain and their eventual demonstration was indeed right and correct. He also outlined what will be the next step for the union. We are going to serve claim for representational rights. We are in the process of getting the letters out. We're going to write to the Chinese to let them know that the vast majority of the workers on this project are members of UK. And as such, we are going to be claiming representation. We hope that we'll get a cooperation both from the Chinese and the Ministry of Labor. When TVJ News visited the area this morning, we were informed by the workers that they were told by the liaison officer to return to work until an agreement is reached. Only some workers were observed in safety gear. The group of, work of Jamaican workers employed to lay pipes, among other duties, remain off the job. The BITU, which represents that category of workers, says they're still waiting for a meeting the with the Labor Ministry. The trade union stands ready, be 12 at midnight or 3 a.m. in the morning, to be called to a meeting by the Ministry of Labor or China Harbor to resolve the impasse that now exists at the Mandela Highway. The situation is untenable, and as trade unions, we can't allow the country to be held to ransom. At least one of the workers told our newsroom that they will not be returning until their concerns are resolved. Residents in Port Antonio, Portland, are appealing to the Portland Municipal Corporation to clear the drains which are posing a serious health hazard. We have more in this report. The MPs and the government need to come in and sort it out. Too long Port Antonio has been left behind. It's time now for Port Antonio to become on the forefront. An urgent call for the Portland Municipal Corporation to undertake a drain cleaning activity in Port Antonio, particularly the Foreshore Road area. The residents say the state of the drains is not only an issue in terms of possible flooding, but it's also a major health hazard. This, this, this draining system in Port Antonio is full of maggot, mosquito, worm, ringworm. It, it, it's really nasty. We see people fell, fall in it, and you know, they, they must have the hospital because I, I, this thing is corrupt. We see school picnic, everybody dropping in it. In the nice man, we are asking the police. From last week, Thursday morning, I came here and look where the, the, the food place is that is tasty. And this stagnant water is here for how long? It's more than three months this water is here for. And I don't think this should, should happen. We have parish council, we have the MPs. You want to tell me that nobody at all realized that the condition is bad here? We didn't start following. Your doctor, driver, everybody are flooding. They say the drains have not been cleaned for more than three months. The residents also pointed fingers at the municipal corporation, saying it is not doing enough to clear drains, which is often the cause of flooding. I appeal to the mayor of Port Antonio, we don't know you. For you get mayor ship, we don't know you. We need to know you. Be like Mr. Benny White. Big labor here. You're not going put out no work in town of Port Antonio. Benny White is a the fire truck and wash you out. Concerned about the preparedness of the parish for the 2018 hurricane season, one resident made this suggestion. Take it to people who are dumping the garbage in the street. That's the drain is can't block up because that's our problem. So we ask you now, please to keep the drain them clean. Anthony Log, TVJ News.
Students who sat this year's Grade 6 Achievement Test, GSAT, will be receiving their results today. TVJ News reported on Tuesday that all GSAT subjects except for mathematics saw improvements in performances. Speaking on TVJ's Smile Jamaica program on Thursday, Chief, Execu Chief Education Officer for the Education Ministry, Grace McLean, explained that her ministry had expectations that there would have been a decline in mathematics. When this cohort actually did the grade four literacy test about two years ago, we saw a decline. I think at that time it was by about three or 3.8 or there about percentage points. And so we have worked, our national numeracy coordinator and her team have worked exceptionally hard to prepare these students. And so even though it has not increased in comparison to last year for GSAT, we believe that we were able to move these students up about two percentage points from where they were. Over 30,000 students sat the 2018 GSET exams, the final staging of the examinations. According to the Ministry of Education, 80% were placed in one of their preferred schools. The others were placed in schools which are in close proximity to the schools they, they currently attend or close to where they live. Concerns this afternoon in the health sector following reports of an extremely high neonatal mortality rate at one of the island's leading hospitals. Neonates are newborns less than one month old. The Health Ministry's quarterly report, Vitals, shows a neonatal death rate at the University Hospital of the West Indies of 111.1 per 100,000. That's the highest in the public health care sector. Noel Holmes Public Hospital in Hanover was second with a neonatal death rate of 60.7 per 100,000. Now, when TVJ News checked with the university hospital, officials questioned the numbers published by the ministry's report. It's understood that the hospital is now checking its record to do a comparison. The Victoria Jubilee Hospital had the third highest mortality rate of 23.1 per 100,000, followed by Mandeville Hospital with 20.5. The national average is 20 per 100,000. We go on to news overseas in the United States. The Environmental Protection Agency's administrator is under fire for allegedly trying to use his position to help his wife open her own restaurant. It's just the latest in more than a dozen actions that have put him under investigation. Details from the CNN. Scott Pruitt apparently tried to use his position as head of the Environmental Protection Agency to get his wife a franchise with Chick-fil-A. As astonishing as that sounds, even more astonishing, it's all in writing in government emails. On May 16, 2017, Pruitt's former aide, Sidney Hupp, from her official EPA email account, writes to Chick-fil-A CEO Dan Cathy. Administrator Pruitt asked me to reach out to you about a potential meeting. Days later, Hupp sends a second message to Chick-fil-A. The administrator would like to talk about a potential business opportunity with Mr. Cathy. Pruitt's wife started the process but never became a Chick-fil-A franchisee. It is just the latest in a long stream of ethically questionable moves and spending gaffes that has ethics experts amazed just how Pruitt is able to hold on to his job. It's mind-boggling how long the list of potential ethics violations are. Earlier this week, it was revealed Pruitt sent an EPA staffer on government time to run personal errands, including asking the Trump Hotel about buying a used mattress for him. The list of probes or investigations into Pruitt is a long one, from leasing a D.C. condo from a lobbyist's wife below cost to spending tax dollars on first-class travel and weekend trips home, handing out jobs and pay raises to political aides, holding questionable meetings with companies seeking EPA favors. Thirteen separate probes now underway involving Pruitt, and yet he keeps his job. And we go now to sports. 2,000 Guineas winner Commander 2 with apprentice Javanil Patterson riding for trainer Patrick Taylor warmed up for the Jamaica Derby later this month by capturing the open allowance contest over seven furlongs on the midweek program at the Caymanas Park. The three-year-old Bay Gelding was scoring his fourth consecutive victory. 
Commander 2, who was sent off the 3-5 to five favorite in the field of 7, was kept off the early fractions set by Armageddon before taking control in deep stretch and going on to score a comfortable victory. Forget time for arms, 5-16s to run, Commander 2 and Armageddon in a fight for it up front, and Commander 2 now snatches a slim lead. Armageddon is over on the rail. Birdie, my love, asked to close up in the center with Lottery Ticket and Radical. Bilingual is chasing in behind them with nowhere to go at the moment, but Commander 2 is now called on for everything as they leave the furlong pole. Bilingual chasing in earnest down against the rail. Birdie my love and lottery ticket left in behind but Commander 2 continues to find more. Under a powerhouse drive Commander 2 wins it. Bilingual and a lottery ticket have gone by together. It's close. These are followed up. Commander 2 who was racing against the older horses for the first time came home in 1 minute 25 and 3. A pretty decent time to win by a length and a quarter. Finishing ahead of lottery ticket by Lingual and Birdie My Love completing the frame. The trainer don't really give me an instruction as, as usual. Don't give me an instruction but frankly he don't run for a while so I tell myself that I'm going to save him as much as possible until the half mile attack. Because from the Guinness is the first run this back again and... I work him and I tell the trainer that I'm ready again, so trainer, so just find a race, I'm going to win a race again. And he did it very, very, very well. Today was it like an exercise for the most important race of the year, Derby. So I told the jockeys, just go out and ride a tactical race. I said, just try to teach him to hold up, because in the Derby, I don't want, it, I don't want a lead. So you have to start it from here. So I use this as a prep run for everything, is exercise to hold up and do everything. And I'm pleased, not only with the horse, but with the, with, with the ride. Elsewhere on the program, there was a double for apprentices, Javanil Patterson and O'Neill Scott, while trainer Patrick Wacky Lynch had a double on the 10 race card as well. Meanwhile, leading rider Anthony Thomas, who fell from his mount rambunctious links in the first event, went to the Spanish Sun Hospital and did an X-ray which showed no injury, and he should be able to resume riding come Saturday. Reporting from Caymanas Park, I'm Spencer Darlington for TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. I'm Herman Green. Remember, the primetime news package is at 7 this evening. Do join us then. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, good afternoon. <music>